Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Whitford, and I am the Meteorite Collections Coordinator at the Abrams Planetarium. And uh, this is the eighth edition of They Came From Outer Space, uh, talking about uh, all things that fall from the sky, uh, whether it's meteorites, um, mostly meteorites, but uh, do you know what? Some terrestrial rocks fall from the sky. And uh, maybe we can get into that a little bit more uh, later if we talk about meteor wrongs um, that fall. But uh, today uh, is kind of a special edition. We are going to talk about the Abrams Planetarium collection of Michigan meteorites. And if you run down the list, uh, there are 12 named Michigan meteorites. And... Then there's another one that is kind of got a generic name uh, that is somewhat out of the norm uh, for being a, quote, named Michigan meteorite. Oh, and as you can see, I've got a glove on today. Um, and we're going to be handling some meteorites and showing them to you. And uh, so this is a uh, an abbreviated presentation that I uh, give. Uh, to groups and things like that when they ask for something here at the planetarium. And uh, I hope that uh, you enjoy it. So with that, we'll get started uh, with uh, Michigan's first known meteorite, which is the Grand Rapids meteorite, right there. It is an iron meteorite. It was located in Kent County. It was found in 1883. Uh, the total mass weighed 114 pounds. It's an iron with uh, medium octahedrite, and um, they measure that by measuring the bands uh, that you see there. And those are Vidmanstaten bands. Um, they only occur in space as the molten metal, once it was ejected, is cooled. Uh, about a degree a year, and that can take millions of years, but it has a, a beautiful pattern to it right there. Uh, it was discovered by Michael Clancy, who was a contractor, while making an excavation for a building on land belonging to the Catholic Church in 1883. It was found three feet below the natural level of the ground and wedged between two large boulders. So no one saw this fall. Uh, it was a find, and chances are it was probably deposited by the glaciers um, years and years ago. So um, that's how Grand Rapids came about. The slice that you're seeing here is, is uh, right through the center of the mass. This is a center slice. So uh, you could just imagine a 114-pound... Uh, meteorite, iron meteorite. So, um, so that's uh, Michigan's first first uh, uh, meteorite. The um, next meteorite is our only Upper Peninsula meteorite, and so this is pretty special. Um, this is the Iron River meteorite, and you can see it's been etched as well with the. Uh, the Vidmanstaten pattern that's there. This is though a, what they call a fine octahedrite. So the lines are thinner on this one. Uh, discovered in Iron County in 1889, but it wasn't recognized until 1965. The entire mass weighed 3.13 pounds, and it contains about 8% nickel in it. So quite a bit of nickel. In 1889, Peter Peterson, a boy of age six, was helping his father clear a field for its size than others. Oh, the, the rock was much heavier for its size than others. Seventy-five years later, in 1965, after another extraterrestrial event, Ellsworth Peterson, son of Peter, sat in his home in Lansing and read a story about a meteorite found near Kalkaska. He requested the stone be sent to him, and he brought it into the Abrams Planetarium. So the Iron River meteorite, this is an end cut here 
Um, if you look very closely, you can kind of see a rollover lip on it. Um, there it is. Right there. How it comes back over the stone on its entry through the atmosphere, um, sending uh, molten material to the back. So, um, Iron River, this is, um, we have a couple of small pieces of this. Unfortunately, the uh, main mass from this um, may have either been borrowed or walked out of the planetarium sometime in the mid-90s. So, and that's very unfortunate. Uh, it happens with a lot of institutional collections. Uh, things tend to, to gather legs and go, and now we've got uh, um, security measures in place that uh, that's not going to happen. So, um, another uh, meteorite, this is the first find. This is the first fall, actually. Uh, the two finds that you just saw, and here is um, a fall. This is Reed City. This happened in Osceola County in 1895. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I picked up the wrong one. I've got them all spread out around me, so this is actually another, another find that we're going to see, the third meteorite. My apologies for that. Uh, this is Reed City, Osceola County, 1895 found by uh, Mr. Ernest Rupert, a small farmer and junk dealer on his farm while plowing in September of that year. It was displayed in a hotel window in Reed City where Professor Walter Barrows from the Michigan Agricultural College saw it in December of 1898. And that's when uh, they had it classified in that. Uh, this is an ungrouped iron. This one also contains about eight percent nickel and you can just see that beautiful Vidman statin pattern there with a couple of other inclusions sulfite and things like that that are in it um, and this is uh, just a slice that's the uh, earlier planetarium number and the edge of the meteorite right there um, so uh, very interesting, again, another find uh, out of a farmer's field, which is a, truly a common story in Michigan. Uh, and that's why I try to um, never turn down people from bringing in meteorites. If they say, hey, I found it, and it weighs quite a bit, it was in my field and that. And here is probably the main mass of the Reed City meteorite. This has been etched so you can see the pattern and this is the outer rind of it if you could see that there. Okay and some pretty deep regmaglyphs and things like that that are in this but um, a very cool main mass of that particular iron meteorite. Again uh, classified by Michigan State University. Um, uh, Michael, welcome, uh, yeah, watching out there. Um, now our first fall, um, which turns out to be, no surprise, an ordinary chondrite. This one from Allegan in 1899. Okay. This one fell in Allegan. Uh, the mass was 32 kilograms or 70 and a half pounds. It's an ordinary chondrite known as an H5, which means it contains um, quite a bit of uh, nickel iron in it. Uh, so it is magnetic from that standpoint. And it still has a few chondrules because uh, it's very um, friable. And if I were to take my thumb and just rub, 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 uh, I'd have some chondrules uh, separate from it, as well as some of the matrix. But um, this stony meteorite fell on Thomas Hill on the Saugatuck Road about 8 a.m. July 10th, 1899. According to Mr. Walter Price, the stone came from the northwest 
and passed within 40 feet of where he was working, striking the ground about 10 rods or 165 feet behind him in sand and burying itself to the depth of about a foot and a half. So this was buried uh, in the sand there. If you've ever been to that area, you know there's quite a bit of sand with some of the dunes and things like that. Um, this shows the interior gray matrix here and uh, the fusion crust that only is about a millimeter thick and it uh, gets that as it makes its way and burns its way through the atmosphere. So, but um, you could see it appears to be pretty crumbly and, and honestly, uh, it is. So, but uh, that would be our first fall, uh, Michigan's first fall. And, you know, these are really um, uh, Michigan treasures, um, uh, unique items, uh, unique artifacts uh, that represent our place in space history um, with the fall of uh, an asteroid and then ultimately a meteorite that could be recovered. A word about the Allegan meteorite. Some of the specimens that you might see if you're out and about and if you're looking um, will oxidize because of the nickel iron that's in them and they will turn kind of a rusty brown in those areas. So it won't be as nice and white or gray as the specimen I just showed you. And for being around since um, 1899, it's still pretty fresh, uh, which is really nice. And uh, now we'll get to another fall, which is uh, Rose City. So we had Allegan and then Rose City came along in 1921. Uh, this was an observed fall. And you can see the uh, nickel iron flecks that are in it. See them? And the outside crust. What's left of it. Not much. And uh, the old museum numbers. Uh, maybe I should say a little bit about those. Um, they used to mark uh, the inventory number on the rock itself. Uh, sometimes they would use a pen. Uh, that was white or black perhaps. Sometimes they would use like some white out and then write a number in black on that. Um, or they would print a sticker and stick that on it through the years. Um, if these come from several different collections and they're being bought and traded in that, a lot of times these numbers can uh, tell you the provenance from where it came from. Uh, perhaps another museum collection or a collector or something like that. Or if you have the original ID card or invoice, which I believe we do on, on some of these, um, they all tell about the provenance, and that's, that's very important in, uh, in meteorite history, uh, the collections that it went through. So um, I guess I need to tell you a little bit about this. On October 17th at 11 p.m., after the appearance of a brilliant meteor moving north-northwest to south-southeast over the northeast portion of the Lower Peninsula with detonations, three stones uh, fell about nine miles northeast of Rose City where they were found the next day. So um, that is actually pretty cool. Uh, the reason that the matrix on this is dark is it had it tells us about its life in space which was pretty violent uh, this rock had been turned to liquid at some point just melted by the impact uh, and we call these impact melt uh, meteorites um, and so that's why you've basically got a starry surface here on some of these, you could probably see a uh, different coloration between here and here. And sometimes you can absolutely see the rivers of melt within the face of these rocks. So where the, where the uh, stone just flowed uh, from that. So uh, pretty unique. Where Allegan, because it was uh, so 
white, gray, whatever it might be. Um, Allegan had a pretty posh life in space, so uh, not much happened to it as far as being beat up by its brothers and sisters up there, okay? Those larger asteroids. So, um, had a pretty good life. Uh, another find that we have, and I'm reaching over here, sorry about that, is Seneca Township right here. Seneca Township. Kind of looks like a spearhead, doesn't it? Just a little bit. Uh, na a natural spearhead. And this is another iron. You can see the Vidman statin pattern. This is, again, a medium octahedrite because of the width of that pattern, those lines. This was found in 1923 in Lenaway County. Uh, someone said it had fallen in June of 1903, but the corrosion on it makes it most unlikely. Um, and uh, so when this was found, somebody basically, the finder said, oh, no, we saw it fall, you know, 20 years ago and that. But when science got a hold of it, it probably had a lot of oxidation and rust on the outside of it and they said no way was this you know a, a find that or a fall that someone just uh left for 20 years for somebody else to find so um this is um the specimen here at the planetarium and uh you don't see too much of seneca township so uh, an unusual meteorite um our next meteorite's probably uh, among one of my favorites of the Michigan meteorites here at the planetarium, and that is the Kalkaska meteorite. And we've had people come in from Kalkaska just to say, hey, can I see that meteorite if you still have it? And sure enough, this is the main mass of the Kalkaska meteorite. And you can see all of the regmaglyphs and deep impressions within it okay and it's quite a hefty hefty meteorite the main mass on this was just about 21 pounds uh, this is what's left of the main mass because pieces have been sliced off and traded with other institutions and scientific analysis and things like that uh, this is a bandwidth of 1.0 millimeters. It's an octa a medium octahedrite again. This was discovered by Arthur R. Seeding in 1947 or 48 while he was working his field and he heard the cultivator blades strike metal. Upon locating the object, it turned out to be heavier than suspected. Do you uh, see a similar storyline here with some of the others? Um, and his brother-in-law saw the object and took it to MSU. In 1964, Mr. Seating donated it to the university collection, which is great. And here's one of those slices that was cut from it. And you can see the Vidman statin pattern there on the, the face of it. And... Um, uh, this one uh, shares something with one that we're going to talk about a little bit later. But um, the main mass of the Kalkaska meteorite, um, uh, certainly a nice find and uh, a beautiful, artistically sculpted extraterrestrial rock. Wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? So the next meteorite I don't have to show you is called Southern Michigan. Southern Michigan. Um, it's suspected that this was a slice of a meteorite uh, that was found in a specimen drawer of a university among their mineral collection, which is not unusual um, for universities and the major collections to, to locate a meteorite within their drawer that's unnamed and they can't find it. So they send it in, give it a name. It the specimen was found in 1965 in the drawer. It weighs 49 grams. It's a medium octahedrite. Um, but beyond that, there isn't much other information. And um, it's one of those that's really hard to pin down. So, um, and as well with 
southern Michigan. Um, out of the um, 12 classified specimens, if we account for 11 named ones from a location instead of southern Michigan, um, there are 11 named Michigan meteorites. Our collection holds 10 of the 11. Um, the Coleman meteorite is the only meteorite that we're missing at present uh, of having a, a complete state set, basically. Uh, it was, uh, it fell in 1994 in October of that year in Midland County. It weighed just over a pound, so it was a rather small stone. It's an ordinary chondrite, uh, a shocked brachia, uh, which means there could be fragments and fractures and things like that of perhaps other stones or of the meteorite itself uh, within it. Uh, the story is, is that Mr. Uh, Mr. Tom Hagan uh, recovered a single stone of 469 grams that had penetrated the roof of his house. The meteorite was recovered within 12 hours of observations of a bolide accompanied by a sonic boom. So there were detonations heard with this one, uh, just as there were with uh, Rose City. Uh, detonations are can be fairly common with these. Uh, the flash in the sky or multiple breakups. Uh, even uh, the seismograph registering uh, a meteorite when it's incoming and starts to break apart and explode uh, and have detonations from that. But uh, uh, we're still hopeful that we'll find a piece of Coleman to to add to the collection and um, have a complete set of Michigan's extraterrestrial rocks. Um, just a, that was in um, 1994, and what usually doesn't happen is it's usually some time before another meteorite uh, might penetrate uh, the state's atmosphere, the world's atmosphere, and and wind up in a state like Michigan or something, but um, the Warden meteorite, which is another stony meteorite right here, uh, you could see the fusion crust on the outside. It's very thin. Uh, I'm trying to remember if this one has any of the paint. Um, sometimes uh, the paint, uh, and in this case, will be on the edge. Uh, this was out of Warden, Washtenaw County, September 1st, 1997. The main mass was just about three and a half pounds. Again, a single stone. It's an ordinary chondrite, as you can see. You can see the chondrules. Sparkly stuff is the iron nickel within it, which has some. This is determined to be a low metal content. But uh, numerous individuals in South Central Michigan reported a daylight meteor around 5, 5.15 p.m. in the afternoon with loud sonic booms and thunder. Um, and thunder, again, they heard, uh, or in the early days, these used to be called thunderstones. Mr. Dwayne Foster and his sons were working in their backyard when they heard a whistling sound passing overhead in front of their house. Upon entering their garage, they found plaster dust pieces of drywall and insulation on the floor. When they noticed the top of their son's car, it was dented, and a rock and two chips from the rock were on the floor. Um, so this is a car smasher. This is what is known in the meteorite world as a hammerstone. It struck something, it damaged something, and in this case it was the roof of a red celica. Uh, many times the item that it damages is, winds up being worth uh, quite a bit of money. And in this case, uh, they decided to have the insurance company um, repair the roof of the car. So uh, there you have it. Michigan has a car smasher uh, right there, and uh, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, Mr. Matt Morgan... Uh, who's a meteorite dealer out in Colorado, uh, has photographs 
uh, showing Mr. Foster up there holding the stone. Um, the car being damaged indented there and you can see all the the dust debris and insulation there and the hole that the meteorite went through uh, the roof of the garage so uh, quite a surprise for that family no doubt and um, and that um, Gail Zemper from uh, Sebring, Florida, welcome aboard. Uh, so, 1997 was the last uh, meteorite that we had seen to fall until January 16th, 2018, at around 10 after 8 in the evening. Um, the sky uh, really lit up that night. Um, on the highway as people were headed uh, uh, towards the southeast Michigan area and uh, saw a very bright light. Security cameras uh, picked up the light uh, as it turned uh, night into day and then back to night again as it came through. Um, there were um, detonations and seismic activity uh, that registered 2.0 um, on that. Uh, the next day, we waited for the, um, the Doppler information to come from NASA uh, so that uh, you know, we could go down and take a look in that. And several employees from planetariums that did take a look. Uh, some were lucky, some were not so lucky. Uh, we were among the not so lucky for the the three days that uh, we spent down there. But if you remember, a strewn field is the area where uh, the meteorite breaks up above and falls, and it's an ellipse, so it's oval, in covering um, the area in which it falls. And so it gives you a really defined space, and Doppler radar is now picking up rocks as they come down through the atmosphere. So it can give finders a really good indication as to where to look and uh, locate those. But um, out of that, um, the Hamburg Fall was about a thousand grams in stones no bigger than this. Uh, most of them very small. And this one has just a couple of chips on it, as you can see. Uh, as it came through the atmosphere and it cooled, there would have been a chondral right there in that light spot that appears to have popped out. And that's been noticed on several of these. Uh, you can see the tiny regmaglyphs or thumbprints that are in it, another telltale sign that it's a meteorite. Uh, the black fusion crust, the fresh, velvety, matte black fusion crust on this. Um, and most of those rocks that were recovered were covered by fusion crust. This has been determined to be an ordinary chondrite, an H uh, level, H4, which means that it's high in iron nickel content. And uh, hundreds of people from seven states has observed a very bright fireball over the skies of southeast Michigan around 8 10 p.m. Many noted a sonic boom and thunder. Several pieces were recovered from the frozen lake surfaces within Hamburg Township over the next few days. The U.S. Geo Survey again recorded a 2.0 magnitude earthquake uh, with this entering the atmosphere. And um, Michigan is, is quite the vegetative state, lots of lakes and things like that. Had it not been for it being January, the lakes being frozen with uh, fresh white snow on them, uh, probably few stones would have been recovered because within a few days things started warming up, the ice started melting, and I'm sure the rocks are at the bottom of the lake. Uh, and with the vegetation so thick, uh, a lot of private roads and private drives, private lakes, uh, basically kept you from finding anything. 
And um, it's always important to ask permission. Uh, if you're entering someone's property to look for a meteorite, um, they appreciate that. And uh, maybe you can make out some sort of an agreement some sort of agreement with them to split whatever it is that you find. So um, always a possibility. Um, you can take a, I saw people out there with huge magnets and metal detectors and on snowmobiles and sleds and jet skis and, and who knows, you name it. Um, and some of them would drive right by the stones. And um, actually how we acquired this one was through an individual that found two less than 50 feet apart and there were snowmobile tracks right next to it and uh, we were fortunate enough to acquire this specimen for our collection uh, and it's very fresh so uh, so that was 2018 in January um, at the end of the year we were thinking because we're working on this brand new exhibit uh, for the public to see and uh, we figured that, great, we've got the meteorites we need, we're missing one, maybe we can fill it in. And then all at once the news says, hey, there's an iron meteorite out there that uh, has been serving as a barn door stop for 50 years in Michigan. And um, it's been sent in for classification. So um, that was a little bit of a surprise. And then the next thought that comes across is, so how do we get a piece of this for our collection? Um, if it's sold, it could go to, who knows, California. It could go to auction. Um, it could be a long time before we even ever saw a slice of it. Uh, anything like that. And um, through a generous donation, um, we were able to purchase the meteorite um, from the owner direct. And this is the Edmore meteorite right here. Look at the regmaglyphs on that, huh? Isn't that beautiful? And if I flip it over here, look at those. As long as I don't drop it on the computer, it's 22 and a half pounds of nickel iron. Okay, and you got the regmaglyphs there, as you can see. So, and we got a cut end here because we took some slices off the end. And um, there, so you can see that it hasn't been etched or polished yet. Um, but this was found in Montcalm County uh, in 1939. It was classified in 2018, um, and that means it was assigned a name, Edmore being the closest post office. Uh, that's the name it received. In 1939, it was by the pre one of the previous owners said to seen to fall and recovered on a farm in Michigan, supposedly in 1939, used as a doorstop to the barn. The story passed from the original owner to the new buyer of the property as well as the meteorite. So imagine purchasing a home and all at once the owner says to you, oh, and by the way, this rock, this strange rock accompanies the sale of the home. Well, when the owner, the new owner wound up selling his home, um, he decided to take the meteorite with him and not leave it with the next owner, which was probably a decent idea um, because he gained an iron meteorite in the process but as far as the question of being seen to fall um, just make a couple of comments here there are some straight cuts and if you can see it it runs right up through there one of them over there some straight cuts and there's another good one here somewhere oh yeah right here and you can see that cut right there that did not occur coming through space. Um, those occurred probably by being hit with a uh, disc blade. Um, when it got stuck, uh, it left its mark. 
And um, who knows for how many decades, because this is a actively plowed farm field, that the meteorite had been struck by this because it's got several cuts on it. And um, so it was actually a find, it wasn't seen to fall. Um, October of 1938, H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds was released. And, um, you know, there was some panic that Martians were going to invade Earth and everything. But in 1939, even a larger meteorite went overhead of Michigan and landed in Ontario, Canada. Uh, it rattled windows throughout mid-Michigan. Um, seemed like every week in the newspapers during 1939, there was always a story about meteorites and things from space and that. And so um, people were, were um, on guard for anything that uh, might occur like that. But uh, Edmore is uh, the latest addition to uh, the Michigan meteorites and, um, and the collection. So, again, kind of an interesting story, and that's why we never turn down anything that uh, somebody says they may have a unique rock. I'm always happy to look at it. It provides an educational moment. Um, um, most of the institutions today do not um, have the public bring in rocks or maybe just one day out of the year they'll have um, some sort of event where they'll say you can bring in your rocks and we'll take a look at them. But um, for the most part, there are just a couple of universities and uh, maybe a couple of private um, dealers that will actually do the testing and that uh, to see if you do have a meteorite and then take it to the next level. So um, if you want to get online uh, at some time, there is a publication out there that is free in PDF format. And all you have to do is type in Meteorites of Michigan. Meteorites of Michigan. It's bulletin number five of the Geological Survey. It was last published in 1968. Uh, so it is not up to date. Uh, with the rest of Michigan meteorites. Um, a new addition is in the works, but it's going to take a little while. We're going to include all of the new finds and falls, uh, as well as those uh, reported to have fall and have been identified uh, by locals as meteorites, but not by uh, the scientific community. Um, so, so we're hoping to include a little bit of that uh, within the new edition, uh, maintaining much of the flavor of the old edition, uh, which one of the directors here at the planetarium had a hand in, uh, Von Dell Chamberlain. And um, he's contributed uh, quite a bit to um, the study from Michigan State University. So with that, you have seen uh, virtually, uh, the Michigan Meteorite Collection. Um, we're hoping to get it back on display real soon uh, through the grant project that we've been working on. Uh, they will be our featured uh, meteorite uh, collection, uh, along with a whole host of other meteorites. Uh, Moon, Mars, Vesta, as we've talked over the last eight episodes. So um, with that, uh, I know that uh, Shannon has uh, placed on the Facebook page um, a link to where you can uh, give a donation uh, to the planetarium, if you would, during this time. It helps with our programming and things like that. Uh, for the moment, we are uh, still closed uh, to the public. But uh, hopefully in the near future, we'll be back open again. Um, remember, always uh, keep an eye on our Facebook page because of Celestial Storytime and the experiments and uh, the sky edition issues and things like that. And uh, with that, 
I thank you for your time uh, in um, viewing us and enjoying a little bit of uh, Michigan's history, uh, our terrestrial history, our extraterrestrial history. And uh, keep your eye on the sky. Until next time, this is Craig Whitford from Abrams Planetarium. Take care.